So now I'd like to introduce our speaker. A lot of people know who he is. Um, today the speaker is Dr. Uh, Bennett Leifer. He is with Prospect Medical in Midland Park. Um, he's a geriatrician, um, long-standing physician, and the medical director of Van Dyke Manor and Van Dyke Healthcare. Um, I'll let him talk a little bit about his background, and he's here to talk to you about um, preventative medicine. Thank you, Dr. Leifer. Hi there. Okay. Um, it's hard to see everybody since I can't see you, so this is going to be an unusual... <laughs> I'm uh, going to have to entertain myself unless I get a chance to see all of you out there. But um, I am the director of geriatrics for the Valley Medical Group. Um, I'm a board certified internist and geriatrician, and I'm also the director of Family of Caring Van Dyke um, Rehab Facility in Ridgewood. So today's topic is an ounce of prevention. And basically we're gonna go through some of the more um, common interventions with a focus on how it relates to older folks in the community and maybe dispel some myths and bring together some um, thoughts about what's really worth your while in terms of uh, what you're going to be doing to stay healthy. Um, and that at the end of it, We'll also maybe talk a little bit, if we have time, about preventing dementia, which is my area of expertise and my greatest interest overall. So let's get started with some of the bread and butter, the um, actual issues you face in your annual um, physical, some of which are the annual well visits with uh, for Medicare patients. And first up is mammograms. So. Clinical trials have shown that screening mammograms for women in their 50s and 60s does decrease breasts, breast cancer deaths, and that's um, something that's not uh, controversial. The issue becomes more interesting and more challenging when we're dealing with women older than their 60s and moving into later life about is there a value to mammography and how do you make that decision? Sometimes it's on a personal basis between you and your physician, especially if there are high risk situations. But interestingly, despite the United States Preventive Service guidelines, more than half of the women in the United States continue mammography after 75 years. Um, of note, uh, studies have shown that screening with mammography um, past uh, the age of 75 years is not associated with substantially decreasing breast cancer deaths in the eight years they followed the study group. So though we do it, um, it may be providing a bit more uh, reassurance than it's providing actual benefit. So the conclusion from the United States Preventive Service Task Force is that women older than uh, 75 may not um, really decrease their chances of dying from breast cancer by continuing mammography after that age. That being said, there are specific instances where in conjunction with your own doctor um, or gynecologist, primary care doctor, you, you may choose to go further and have mammograms later in life, especially if there are um, high uh, risk populations, people with certain uh, genetic tendencies, and these are individual decisions to make with your doctor. But on the whole, looking at large populations of patients, um, women older than 75 did not decrease their chances of dying by continuing mammography. Colonoscopy. This is a fun test. I'm sure everyone really looks forward to doing this. And basically, again, I'm focusing on the older population. We know that um, after 50 years of age, it's certainly a benefit, and the guidelines are recommending um, three to five years. In some instances, if no polyps and you're completely clean on the examination, then you can go maybe seven to 10 years. Obviously, if there is a polyp um, that changes the interval of surveillance to a much shorter period. So the decision to screen people after the ages of 76 up to 85 should be an individual one. And again, similar to mammography, though this 
is a little more challenging because certain people do have um, risks of familial tendencies to polyps that could transform into more ominous or worrisome findings or colon cancer. So between your overall health and your prior screening history, this is a decision that you would make with your um, GI doctor, your colorectal specialist, your primary care doctor. But once you're beyond the age of 85, um, clearly now the risk of complications such as a perforation or even the general anesthesia may really not result in years of life saved. So that changes the nature of what we would offer in that setting. So the conclusion there is certainly make sure you have a colonoscopy between 50 and 75. Once you're over 75, I think it's uh, a decision that to be made in close consultation with your primary care doctor or your um, GI doctor or your colorectal colonoscopist. People sometimes ask about the uh, newer technology with what's called CT colonoscopy and the um, fecal DNA testing. Um, and what I can say about that is they are interesting modalities, but the task force has not thought of them as being solidly in the plus column as adequate for screening. Part of the problem also is were they to find an abnormality, you're going to need a colonoscopy anyway to deal with it. So the question is um, really their reserved modalities for people who couldn't be anesthetized or have medical conditions that would preclude going through the rigor, which is lately not so rigorous because the technology for the colonoscopy itself has become much easier to endure and much smoother in operation, uh, so to speak. Um, those tests, uh, Cologuard and the CT, have very specific targeted uh, usage and are not considered general um, screening tests for uh, wide swaths of the population. Cervical cancer. So for women age 30 to 65, the United States Public Service Task Force, Preventive Service Task Force, recommends screening every three years. That can be done with what's called a pap smear, you know, standard cytology. You can go out every five years with what's called the um, high human papillomavirus testing, HRPV, which looks for the specific risk factor of the papillomavirus, which can be a inciting factor and a precursor to uh, causing um, cervical cancer. And, or you can go out every five years with some type of combination of that type of HPV testing and cytology. Once you're over 65, again, we're now looking at a different population. And um, if people have had adequate screening, the question becomes whether or not um, there's a benefit there really isn't, unless you're at high risk for cervical cancer, then the potential benefits of false positive and further testing and further complex evaluations aren't outweighed by the risks, that, that outweighs the risk of saving life years. Most of these equations are being done with large populations of people. So everything changes when you're working individually with your own doctor about what applies specifically to you. Ovarian cancer, um, more than anything, I wish uh, that we did have a screening test, but there really isn't, though there are many tests that can help follow ovarian cancer progressions in existing patients. Those tests have not been shown to be adequate as screening tests for general population, so the net balance of benefits and harms is negative. No one really is endorsing this. Again, this doesn't apply to everybody. And if you're in a population where there is genetic tendencies or certain genetic markers that changes the weighting of how your genetic risk is, certainly then that opens up to specific angles as to what you and your provider, this, in this case probably would be a um, obstetrician gynecologist, would recommend for your specific assessment. It's no longer screening because screening really applies to large populations. 
once you're looking at things differently on an individual basis, you're doing what's called case finding, and that changes the whole nature of what we're you know, looking to accomplish. And I know this kind of is a little bit of a semantic game, but it's important to understand that screening applies to thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or millions of people going through certain tests to find people where the treatment of the disease would result in saving their lives or decreasing them from being sick. But case finding has to do with you on your own with a specific tendency or a precursor or a prodromal phase of an illness that we're looking not only to uh, prevent, but from getting worse because your circumstances sort of have you step outside of the whole populations that we're looking at. This will become a little bit more clear when, when I talk about prostate cancer. As for osteoporosis, the United States Preventive Service Task Force recommends screening for osteoporotic, osteoporosis with bone measurement testing, DEXA, to prevent osteoporotic fractures in women 65 years and older because we have treatments. So this is a worthwhile endeavor to do. It's interesting that there's insufficient evidence to recommend, again, screening, not case finding, to prevent osteoporotic fractures in men. So there's a little divergence here in terms of uh, who has adequate treatment that benefits screening and who, whether it's limited to have a value, so large swaths of patients and populations really don't benefit from doing this evaluation. Um, this is something else that you, know, you discuss in conjunction with your own doctor. And it changes dramatically if you have higher risk factors for severe osteoporosis or you've had fractures or other things that kind of lead you again outside of the screening parameters and into a case finding where you yourself have significant risk factors that need to be dealt with differently. And in which case, even serial bone density testing may be appropriate, especially if you initiate treatment with your um, provider. So getting back to prostate cancer, um, this is where it gets a little dicey and, and there's no easy answers about putting everything into one column or another. I hate to say it, this really isn't a menu. We're, we're really not sitting here deciding between column A and column B. Most of these discussions require a good relationship and interaction with your primary care provider, whether it's your OBGYN, your doctor, your nurse practitioner, or your physician's assistant who you see regularly. So they know when screening is appropriate for you and when case finding or individual tailoring of an assessment or a test is appropriate for your specific situation. So men aged 55 to 69 years old, the decision to undergo a PSA, a prostatic specific antigen, is really an individual one because there are potential harms and benefits. The screening itself has been very controversial and throughout time the studies have vacillated back and forth between saving lives, causing harm, saving lives, causing a little more harm, and now there is more of a weighting that a small potential benefit of reducing the chance of death from prostate cancer can uh, be yielded by doing this. However, many men will experience potential harms including uh, false positive results, additional testing can happen. They can be overdiagnosed for a condition they don't have. They can end up with prostate biopsies, which they may not need. That can end up causing complications, including infection, even sepsis. They can be overtreated, and they can also end up with incontinence and erectile dysfunction. So you want to be really sure that if you're going to go down this kind of uh, pathway and initiate these assessments, again, screening, looking at large populations, you don't want to be going down some kind of misadventure and lead to other problems that certainly would not benefit um, the patient. So patients and clinicians should consider the benefits and harms on the basis of family history. There are some new genetic studies that are looking at uh, familial cancer risks as affecting men as well ethnicity, 
comorbid conditions. And again, it falls down on patients' values. Some people can't live without, you know, kind of knowing or not knowing what's going on. And other patients um, uh, would rather not know because they wouldn't act on it. And again, uh, the United States Preventive Service Task Force recommends against PSA screening in patients who are 70 years or older. Going to move on in one second. Okay. No, it's not COVID. I just had to blow my nose. Okay. So adult immunizations, and I'm going to start this off with hepatitis C, though there's no immunization for it, only because this is an interesting and common condition that requires some evaluation and assessment. Then we're going to move on to good old influenza, pneumococcal pneumonia, varicella zoster, which is um, shingles, um, and tetanus, diphtheria pertussis, the Tdap, and then we have the tantalizing future of COVID. Um, I'm not Anthony Fauci, so I'm not going to have any specific answers on that, but I, I will toss out uh, some of the current um, thinkings. Um, so hepatitis C is um, is definitely a um, an interesting um, situation. It can infect 180 million people worldwide. It does. In the U.S., hepatitis C is the leading cause of death from liver disease and the number one indication for liver transplantation. So. Now that we know there's very good treatment, it's it's pretty important to um, have an idea about what what is going on with your hepatitis C status. Most adults only need one screening test done once in their lifetime, but patients with ongoing risk factors, people who have a history of possible IV drug abuse or other uh, risky um, hepatitis C transmission conditions should probably be screened more regularly. But if your doctor um, approaches you with um, the notion that they'd like to screen for hepatitis C, it certainly is very reasonable to embark on this. It's, it's not you know, a hostile accusation of some horrible bad life choice you've made. It's actually just good practice because now the occult cases can be found and there is very effective treatments uh, for hepatitis C. So the flu, uh, hopefully you are all getting your flu shots somewhere. And, you know, I'm going to try to give you the straight, straight scoop on the flu shot in all its, you know, different aspects and controversies. So the flu, it's effective. And it doesn't give you the flu by taking the shot. It reduces the incidence of laboratory confirmed influenza it can reduce the risk of serious complications and death associated with illness in children and adults. So basically, go out and get your flu shot. It is not too early. Now is the time. Go get it. Don't hesitate. Uh, it's covered by Medicare. There's really no excuse. It doesn't cause the flu. The effectiveness of the seasonal influenza vaccine can prevent the influenza illnesses, and it depends on a several, num several factors, including the match, you want to be sort of lucky, um, circulating strains. What's very interesting right now is because of the travel bans between countries, basically south of the equator where they were finishing their flu season to us now embarking on our flu season, there's been very little flu transmission because people aren't traveling internationally. And I'm a bit of an optimist. I'm hopeful that we will not have a co- twin pandemic of flu and COVID, but actually if everyone gets their flu shot and the irony of wearing masks and the lack of travel could actually decrease the um, flu's impact on the north northern hemisphere this year, which would be great. Also, the immunological response of the recipient, you need to have a very good and intact immune system to get the best value of the flu shot, but that doesn't mean if you are immunocompromised, you shouldn't have it. So the vaccine effectiveness is, effectiveness is greatest when the match is close, when we have the right serotypes. I'm sure you've heard of H1N1 and all the different species. The current flu shot 
both for older folks, which is the sort of stronger dose, and people under 65, the less strong dose, carry the quad or the four serotypes, which is really good. And um, But even when the match with the circulating flus out there in the world is a suboptimal match, the vaccination can still substantially reduce the risk of influenza, hospitalization, and death. So that's a, a, a real positive there. Pneumococcal pneumonia. So one of the biggest problems of getting the flu is you can end up having a secondary infection with pneumonia. Currently, there are now two pneumococcal pneumonias. They, these shots after 65 are good for life. You do not need a booster. Under 65 and specifically under 60 is a different story, but all adults 65 and older should receive a one-time dose of the pneumococcal 13, otherwise known as the Prevnar 13, and one dose of the pneumococcal 23, known as Pneumovax 23. For those people starting out on this journey of immunization um, and have not previously received either, either vaccine, um, Prevnar 13 is given first, followed a year later by pneumococcal 23. But those people who have previously received the 23, and there's a lot of people who received Pneumovax, should receive the Prevnar 13 at least one year after that last dose. So don't be surprised if you were new, you know, immunized after 65 and now you're older in you know, your 70s or 80s and you never had the pneumococcal Prevnar 13, your doctor will offer it. And in the medical letter, they all, you know, some of the um, researchers only recommend the pneumococcal 23 for otherwise healthy 65 years old. I think it's not a bad value for the inconvenience. And um, I do recommend getting both to maximize the likelihood that you now would have up to um, you know, 33 different pneumococcal species or valences that, are, um, that you're immune to, which is, which is a good thing. So uh, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, otherwise known as the Tdap. Now, it's interesting, there are very few cases of tetanus. Otherwise, some of, some of you folks remember it as lockjaw. Um, this is a small number, but it's so easy to prevent that it's sort of not inconceivable to at least stay up on your tetanus and diphtheria boosters. Those are given every 10th year. So adults with an uncertain history about whether or not they've had a primary series of these vaccinations in childhood should at least uh, receive the three doses, uh, one of which preferably first should be the Tdap, so that you get the Tdap and then you know the other two uh, boosters. Most people in the United States who are um, born here and gone through the medical system most likely have had it. The first two doses are given at least four weeks apart. The third dose is six to 12 months after the second. And then on the decade, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 would be the TD booster. You don't want to wait until you have a nail in your foot and are in the Valley ER to need it. So it could be a uh, part of your decade uh, review of your immunization status with your primary care provider. And then any adult who has never received a dose of Tdap should receive as soon as possible, regardless of the interval uh, of the last TD containing vaccine. This has to do more with the ad you probably see of the uh, coyote or the fox who is hanging around with the grandchild. There are about 30,000 cases of pertussis or whooping cough in the United States per year. Some of these, unfortunately, do result in infant death. So it is thought that older adults who have not kept up their pertussis or whooping cough vaccination could be the reservoir for these uh, transmissions to grandchildren. So that's why many of you might have been told by your granddaughter, maybe your grandson, if he's really on top of things, or I'm sorry, your, your daughter or your son who are having your grandchild, that, hey, grandma and grandpa, before you can come to the house, well, now you can't come to the house because of COVID, that's a separate problem, but before COVID, you would have to deal with getting a updated Tdap, which would include pertussis and whooping cough. So you 
would not put the infant at risk for whooping cough. So varicella zoster. Now there's two shots out there, a lot of discussion. It's not really controversy as much as it's confusion, but let's see if we can kind of clarify this. This is shingles. People who have functioning immune systems over 50 years old with a history of uh, prior herpes zoster chickenpox infections, and those who've already received um, the prior uh, zoster uh, varicella, that, that's um, uh, the prior vaccine before Shingrix. So that was Zostervax. They can be vaccinated with two doses of Shingrix two to six months apart. It should not be given within two months of having had the prior one, the Zostervax. And if you're starting out anew, the recombinant Shingrix is preferred over Zostervax. But again, some of the uh, researchers do believe that the Zoster, Zostervax vaccine remains a very good alternative for adults over 60. And, you know, this is a, an important concept. I'm not so sure, you know, what the additional benefit is, although no direct comparisons have been available for the Shingrix. It appears to be considerably more effective than Zostervax in preventing shingles. Uh, they did some trials with 27,000 people. It was highly effective in preventing uh, the shingles in all age groups, especially older persons. Uh, 50 to 59 was uh, 97%, and then 60 to 69, uh, and uh, old and 91% of people who are older um, than, than that cohort. The real issue is um, your immunity for this type of infection prevention wanes as we get older. Like, you know, our memories kind of go a little bit naturally. Uh, so does our immunological resilience. So the goal is to get it at the right time. Certainly any time over 50 is appropriate, but um, certainly getting it over 60 to 65 is probably the best way to maximize a good immunological memory because the duration of protection with it is unknown. In people over 70, the vaccine drops to about 85% of its um, effectiveness in the fourth year um, post the vaccination. So seventh inning stretch, everybody, you can get up. I'm going to get up. I hate sitting and sitting is killing me. And so it, sitting is killing your brain, by the way, which takes us into how to prevent dementia. So I just want to go through, besides sitting, sort of the risk factors for brain impairment. The protective factors against brain impairment and how to have a fit brain. So there are definite risks for losing your mind other than COVID and being stuck in your house. Um, the risks for dementia include age, a family history, a certain genetic profile called the APOE, other genes, uh, believe it or not, people who become, who have, who have um, Down syndrome um, and trisomy, they, they themselves actually have a very high risk for late life dementias and more of them are living to be older um, and surviving other things that in the past would have led to a premature uh, death. They are living old enough to have manifestations of their dementias and that's a risk. Other risks that are now much more um, uh, supported by research include head trauma, lower educational achievement and chronic stress. So we're going to go through some of this um, in terms of what you can do to protect your brain from becoming impaired, sort of dementia prevention. The most likely and easiest thing to do is get outside or go down to the basement or wherever you have your exercise 
equipment or not have exercise equipment and have a YouTube video with some t someone encouraging exercise, but sitting and watching the news is probably the worst thing you can do, not only for your mood, but also for your brain. You need physical aerobic exercise. That is one we'll discuss in a minute. Anti-inflammatory drugs, so far have really not shown that they stop the progression of the um, tangles and other things that are, are problematic for the formation of the garden variety dementias, which is Alzheimer's disease. Low fat diet is interesting, but not for the reasons you might think. It has more to do with cardiovascular and antioxidants and minimal alcohol use. Unfortunately, though alcohol is a good social lubricant, it may even be an appetite stimulant, it's not good for sleep and it's not good for your brain. So we're gonna go through some of these, medications, stress reduction. Again, I'm gonna harp on it till you're sick of me hearing it. So you will get out of your chairs and go do something and exercise because it will protect your brain. Other lifestyle choices, diet and mental activity. So medications and brain health. Drugs for physical illnesses may protect the brain, but they don't do it in the way you would think. So antihypertensives can help prevent dementia, probably because they help prevent mini strokes. And it's found in multiple research studies that there is a confluence and a predilection for a brain that has multiple strokes to be more at risk, one, for having vascular dementia, but it also is a risk factor for garden variety Alzheimer's disease. So it's important to protect your brain by controlling your blood pressure. Statin medication, your Lipitor, your Zocor, they themselves do not prevent Alzheimer's disease and that's been checked out in trials, but they can prevent and work with your antihypertensive regimen and your exercise and your improved cardiovascular and cerebrovascular fitness to help prevent strokes that in and of itself may help prevent deterioration of cognition. So in the words of my favorite doctor from the MASH series, Hawkeye Pierce, Alan Alda, the head bone is connected to the heart bone and don't let them come apart. So it's really important if you want to protect your brain, protect your heart. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, your Advils, Motrins, Ibuprofens, Naprosens, that family has not been shown to stop some of the inflammatory changes associated with dementias. That being said, and I don't have it on the slide, I am beginning to believe that the amount of sugar, and especially additional sugars and the predisposition to diabetes of our population in the United States may evolve into another potential risk factor for dementia and cognitive impairment. There are some people researching the possibility that some forms of dementia, variants of maybe even Alzheimer's disease, might be a type three diabetes. So I really do stress to my patients the importance of watching your sugar intake because sugar in our diets, um, possibly more than even fats, may be what really takes us down because we are having an explosion of diabetes. That also being said, one of the biggest risk factors for a bad outcome with COVID infections is being a diabetic. So the next option are cholinesterase inhibitors. You might've heard of them. Um, Aricept, rivastigmine, they really don't work for mild cognitive impairments, but they do help a bit with dementia of the Alzheimer's type. They hopefully can slow the progression of the loss of some functional status. They will never give back anyone's memory. They're not a panacea and they only have possibly a 40 to 50% likelihood of benefiting the patients receiving them. But for some patients with dementia, it's worth trying. At the same time, there have been studies about brain doping, um, and there really hasn't been robust data that for patients who are 
um, at risk for a late life mild cognitive impairment that, you know, if you have a more or less healthy brain, that, that, that throwing these medicines at you is going to, you know, help you score better on an IQ test. Um, and the reason you're not remembering what your wife says is because she's asking you to take out the garbage and you're ignoring that and pretending you don't hear her. Um, on that note, if you want to prevent dementia, another way is make sure you can hear because hearing deficits are associated with social isolation and worsening dementia. Finally, um, polypharmacy is bad for all geriatric situations, but specifically it can screw up the brain. So I have to say my folks, my patients know that I'm not a big believer in sleeping pills, avoid your NyQuil's, which is basically a shot of whiskey, avoid things with Benadryl or diphenhydramine in it. Those things can make you confused and screw up your brain. Watch your alcohol consumption, that affects your sleep. And I can't stress how important it is to have a good night's sleep, which now that I'm getting older myself and I'm realizing this is really hard to do. It ain't as easy as it was when I was younger. Getting a good night's sleep is crucial for brain health. Stress, let me go back one second, whoops. So stress, uh, for those of you who remember what a cassette tape is, and I'm, I'm showing my age, as my children say, I am a analog man living in a digital world. So as she says, this is my relaxation tape. It's the sound of the ocean waves, crashing onto the shore, snatching my boss's body off his beach chair and carry him out to sea. So easily, not only is this a problem, but COVID and everything that's going on is a tremendous source of stress for all of us. But how does stress affect the memory? Well, anything that bathes the brain in cortisol and the fight or flight adrenergic or adrenaline type hormones have been shown to be really bad, both for humans and for mice. So studies of laboratory animals show that mice under chronic stress conditions have fewer hippocampal neurons, which is where dementia actually begins to show, and have impaired memory compared with their healthy, non-stressed out mice buddies. In humans, we know that several days of intense cortisol exposure impairs memory and performance, and being distracted, chronically stressed can also result in depression and anxiety, and that is also associated with impaired memory and concentration. So what can you do? Well, I know this sounds very new age, and I didn't believe much in it myself until I started taking courses at Valley, which does have some wonderful mindfulness-based meditation uh, courses and training trainers and teachers most of which now is being done um, via uh, virtual programs. And I you know, have to say I do support them because I actually have gone through them. So in short, forms of meditation, specifically MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction, can change the brain. Physically, they can see findings and functional changes in ordinary people and improve their health. So it's not just, you know, kind of, new agey. Um, it certainly is something to consider. And it's also been shown to lower levels of markers of unhealthy inflammation on blood tests. So um, I don't practice it as much as I should, but I do study the value of it. And I do have to say, if you're experiencing chronic stress related to family pressures, our COVID world, our political world, I certainly would recommend looking into uh, mindful uh, mindfulness meditation, the MBSR program, and I'm sure our hosts at Prime Time in the Valley System can give you more information. Would you want to? Should you want to pursue that um, option? And going back to my other favorite topic, which is the exercise issue. So, healthy adults between the ages of 16 and 75 have been studied. So aerobic walking three times a week, building up from a 10 to a 40 minute session was compared to stretching and toning alone. And interestingly, they found that 
um, mental tasks involving executive control, monitoring, scheduling, planning, mental intention, improve significantly both with endurance training, which is running or biking or swimming for a period of time, maintaining, getting your heart rate up, but also weight training. For those of you who like to go to the gym and lift weights or lifting weights in your home, because the gym isn't open yet, um, I, I recommend actually a combination of both because for things like osteoporosis in women, weight training can be helpful uh, to improve uh, their tendency to overt worsening osteoporosis. So I'm a big believer in a combination of both endurance and weight training and stretching and toning. Those patients only scored worse uh, after the six month trial. So, you know, I, I don't know if someone's gonna ask, what about Tai Chi or those exercises? I, I don't have a good answer. I don't think anyone specifically studied some of the newer forms of stretching, toning, and movement. Uh, obviously, anything done vigorously and intensely, and certainly something like Tai Chi or yoga, which can be associated with mindfulness, might also be helpful as well. Um, but if you do have the time, the effort, and can get out there and get your heart rate up, obviously, this should be discussed with your doctor to make sure it's a safe undertaking for you. Uh, it's really reasonable to try to do it because it may help your brain and ward off dementia. Healthy brain diets. This is also an interesting um, area of, of a lot of controversy. And the only part of it that I'm going to summarize or summarize is oxy antioxidants are tested over and over to see what magic bullet will help us. I'm sure antioxidants are good. I certainly never stop anyone from taking the uh, vitamin supplements that the ophthalmologists prescribe. But other than dietary sources, supplemental antioxidants, whether it's E or taking C or other things and vitamins, uh, we, we, we really don't find this doing anything to help your brain. For all those people taking Prevagen, and I, I hope I'm not insulting any of the, um, the loyal, uh, I, I, I have to say there's really no medical study supporting it, and it's not something I would spend my time buying. I'd rather go and uh, get a membership to Mohonk Mountain and go running around um, some of our parks and scenic areas. Having a good experience with nature is very mind cleansing and having doing it with vigorous exercise, you get the double header benefit of, of both of those protective forces to help your brain age better. Moderate caloric intake to avoid illness associated with obesity. This is back to my own view that we're dying deaths of obesity, metabolic syndrome, and I suspect brain problems because we're eating too much sugar. So wherever you can, if you can eliminate excess sugar from your diet, I, I also am becoming a little bit more inclined, though I'm not an expert and I'm still kind of wrestling with the data and the uh, information about inflammation and sugar. But I do believe that obesity and excess sugar is a real problem and it's not good for your brain. Omega-3 fatty acids, the Mediterranean diet with fish oil and olive oil have been shown to be helpful for the brain. It also, there's also the DASH diet and basically avoiding animal fats. You know, I'm not saying you should never have a steak. And also there's studies that eggs, you probably could consume a good number of them, though there is a study that does show that people who eat more eggs have more heart disease, but all these things are taken out of context everything in moderation, nothing to excess, limit your sugars, limit your treats, limit your carbohydrates, and avoid animal fats, and your brain will do better. As for the dietary supplements, again, antioxidants such as E and C, multivitamins, you're probably spending your money on something you don't need if you have a healthful diet. That being said, if you don't have a healthy diet or you can't, for various dietary reasons, maintain 
a healthy dietary intake of fresh fruits and vegetables. Here's my view. If you go to the supermarket, you only eat from the periphery. Everything in the aisles will kill you. Anything in a can or a glassine, uh, you know, a, a plastic wrap envelope, not good. But fresh fruits and vegetables, lean meats, uh, low fat dairy, everything from the periphery of your supermarket is good. And everything else that's packaged, processed, and has enhanced salt and sugar, though it tastes really good, I love potato chips myself, um, is not good for us. So try to find a balance. And again, supplements, again, I, I, you know, quality and there's variability. We barely can get our blood pressure medicines and our other medicines from our um, overseas sources not to be contaminated by carcinogens. I, I really don't know <laughs> if, if there's a value you know, with supplements and, and I'm not a big supplement endorser. I think it's a waste of money. Looking back at some of them that have been looked at, ginkgo, yeah, there was a very slight improvement, but it wasn't an American study. It wasn't rigorously tested. And yes, there's other things from phosphodiol serine. I, I, again, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't spend my money on this. I would go get either a gym membership where you can exercise outside or outside or get a park pass and go out there and walk fast, meet friends, do mindfulness, and kind of um, intersect with nature. It's, it's going to fix your brain, trust me. Go to the Wanaku Reservoir, go out there and, and take a walk in the woods. Mental activity, since this was studied, there's been some controversy. Initially, we thought, well, we know that college graduates have a lower risk of dementia, but they also present later. If you're more educated, you have more brain connections that allow you to cover for whatever type of synapse loss occurs from the effects of dementing illnesses. So it's sort of, you do have a lower risk, but you also present later. But things that can mentally challenge you could be protective. Puzzles, learning a language, reading novels, people doing the Batman thing, you write with your left hand when you sign one set of checks and then the checks to yourself, you write with your left hand, your right hand, uh, mazes, jigsaw. There's certainly in the era of COVID, we're going out of our minds anyway by being so isolated and sequestered. So anything other than television and the news is going to help your brain, I think. So certainly mazes and puzzles are good. Mental aerobics, there is a body of research. It's kind of ongoing, looking at the model of physical fitness. And some people say cross train your brain, uh, similar to physical cross training. And this is the right brain and the left brain. Again, I, I can't cite robust studies that show this works for everybody. But again, we are so isolated. We are so, you know, we're going to what our eighth month of this, that this type of, of isolation and um, one of my patients uh, refers to it as the benign incarceration of the elderly COVID syndrome. You, you can't see your children and if you see your grandchildren, they'll kill you. So, you know, the, the reality here is anything that allows us to be um, more active with our brains um, is, is, is a good thing. So, Exercise is the bottom line and um, do a lot of it. I guess we now open up to questions and our hosts will guide me on how we do that. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Leifer. That was wonderful, so comprehensive. Um, just a couple of questions that I'm getting in, just a couple. Somebody had written here, I'm hoping I'm reading this correctly. If you've already had the shingles and repeated the ZVL, does that make sense? Is it necessary to get RZV? Does that make no, sense? No, well, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm not able to give you a percentage of what additional boost you get. So what I tell my patients is, you know, if you want extra protection, go ahead. If the pharmacy's offering it, if it's safe, you know, you're not on lines without people social distancing, go ahead and add the Shingrix to your prior Zostervax. But a number of researchers believe the Zostervax has been effective. It gives a good bit of immunity and, you know, it's kind of extra icing on the cake to go ahead and add in 
the shingrix on top of it. So, you know, my view is I'd much rather people get a flu shot. I'd much rather people get their Pneumovax series. And then if they've already had the Zostravax, which many people have had, they can look into adding the shingrix into the mix. Thank you, thank you. So this, just somebody had asked a little bit about, um, just talking a little bit more about vitamin D. A lot of people are deficient in that. You know, a lot of physicians will talk about vitamin D. What are your thoughts on that again? Well, vitamin D is really important, but it's not gonna fix your memory. Uh, though there's research looking into that. I mean, the issue with vitamin D is, again, many people who don't get out in the sun can be vitamin D deficient. And it's important to maintain vitamin D because there are correlations with a lot of wellness markers. The biggest issue is certainly for women and for men as they age through 75 into their 80s, you want to have an adequate level of vitamin D with calcium to support bone um, stability and 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 and, 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 and prevent. I can't, you know, it's it's hard to say it specifically prevents osteoporosis. It probably does help osteopenia not get worse. It's not a treatment for osteoporosis per se, but it is in the category where you want to um, certainly stay on vitamin D. A thousand units daily will do you no harm. That with your calcium supplementation. But again, for men, it's interesting. Like iron, a lot of people take it but don't need it. A lot of men aren't osteoporotic and aren't calcium deficient and are taking too much calcium, but vitamin D is certainly um, not inappropriate, especially if we're being conscientious and not exposing ourselves to the sun in a way that would result in skin cancer. So I would say another good discussion to have with your doctor, maybe in conjunction with whether or not you have any markers that would make it appropriate to get a bone density done. And that includes, you know, men who may have vertebral fractures, or other fractures or find themselves, you know, disproportionately shrinking, though unfortunately we all are going to shrink as we get older, both men and women. Okay, thank you. And just a couple more. Um, what is the screening that is done for hepatitis C, doctor? It would be a hepatitis C antibody. So what they do is part of a hepatitis panel, and it's not unreasonable to do the whole panel, though I do believe that the hepatitis C antibody alone is covered by Medicare. But the hepatitis panel uh, that your doctor can order looks to see whether or not you've had a prior exposure or subclinical illness of hepatitis B um, or hepatitis C. And there are specific markers and antibodies um, and antigens that are looked for that kind of show whether or not you've had either an exposure, a subclinical illness, or if you have hepatitis C, whether you are at risk for the complications of hepatitis C. That being said, although it's you know um, much more prevalent in the rest of the world, and it's also more prevalent in in a number of Asian countries, our uh, population has been you know relatively spared because of the quality control of blood transfusion products, dental hygiene care, and appropriate um, preventive um, uh, PPE. Uh, prior to COVID that was has been used and, and implemented for our populations who were at risk of blood-borne um, transmission during procedures or dental work. Okay, thank you. Um, and I don't know if you addressed this, sorry if you did, but if you've never had the shingles vaccine, what is the basic procedure? What would, what would you- You'd go to your pharmacy and you'd ask for Shingrix at this point, and then you'd get the first one and then two to six months later, you get the second shot. So that's that would be it. It's also covered as a drug benefit, I'm pretty sure, under your Part D Medicare. So it's, you know, you don't have to wait to you to go to your doctor's office, which may be a little crazy right now. So you may want to go to, I'm not saying everyone should go to their doctor's office if you're sick. Or at Valley Medical Group, we are open and we are practicing the most enhanced um, preventive services to keep everyone safe. But for Shingrix alone, you, you, you'd get a, you, it's covered. And going to your pharmacy and there are some vaccinating pharmacists. And I know there's some nurse practitioners embedded in some of the pharmacies who are also skilled at doing the Shingrix sequence. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Leif. Thank you so much for a wonderful um, 
presentation. Really appreciate it.